In this exercise, we're going to do a full analysis of the triangular slash hexagonal lattice. So figuring out the primitive lattice factors, primitive reciprocal lattice factors, relevant zone, irreducible relevant zone, the whole thing. So pause the video and sink your teeth in this, and then we'll take this step by step. So let's start by drawing our triangular lattice slash hexagonal lattice. So it's basically a lattice like this, which is made up of equilateral triangles. So just pretend that these dimensions here, these lengths, they're all equal to A. Now, in order to build up this lattice out of primitive lattice factors, we have many different choices. We could, for example, take uh, this one and that one. If we take linear combinations of these two vectors, we'll be able to recover all of the other lattice factors. But in this case, we're going to do uh, slightly differently. We're going to take this as a choice. So let's say that this is our vector A1 and this is our vector A2 with the origin here, obviously. So, uh, so this is the x direction and this is the y axis. So the first thing we need to figure out is what are the coordinates of A1, A2 and A3 for this particular choice of primitive lattice factors. So pause the video and write down the uh, coordinates. So what's relevant here obviously is this equilateral triangle. So we're going to redraw that again. So this is the origin. This is the point A1. Now in terms of uh, dimensions, so again, this is length A and this is also length A. So if we write down what uh, the coordinates of A1 are, so A1 is going to be, so for the X coordinates, you see that what you need to do, this angle here is 60 degrees. So taking the cosine of 60 degrees, will teach you that the x coordinate of A1 is going to be A over 2, or 1 half times A, writing it like this. And then for the y coordinate, sine this time, so this is going to be the square root of 3 divided by 2 times A. Nothing is happening in the z direction, so that's 0. A2 is going to be extremely similar. The only difference, of course, is that it's flipped. So we have a minus sign in the y coordinates. Okay, so this is our A2. For A3, the primitive lattice factor in the z direction. But in the z direction, we do not have any periodicity. But still, we need this A3 component to use the, the formulas to calculate the reciprocal uh, lattice factors. So we're going to just artificially pretend that the structure has a periodicity with a certain period, which we're going to call C. So this is an arbitrary choice, and let's just hope that this arbitrary choice does not play any real physical role. It shouldn't because it's an arbitrary choice, but let's, uh, let's see. Okay, so now pause the video again and use the formulas to calculate the B1, B2, and B3 vectors, so the primitive reciprocal lattice factors. So this is not so difficult, but slightly messy. So let's uh, see what happens. So the formula for B1 is that this is equal to 2 pi times, and then for the numerator, we have the cross product A2, A3. And then for the denominator, the triple product, A1, A2, A3. Okay, just uh, focusing on the A's and the C's, the prefactors here. So for the numerator, we have A2 and A3. So that is going to be an A and a C. And for the denominator, we have A, A and C. First bit of good news is that the C indeed cancels out because it was an arbitrary choice. Anyhow, we didn't expect it to play a big role. So that's indeed confirmed here. Calculating the cross product A2 with A3. So A3 is just going to be the unit factor in the Z direction. 
So the first thing we need to do is the cross product of one X with one Z. So that's going to be minus one Y. So we have minus one half unit factor along the Y direction. Okay, so that's the first part taken care of. Then for the second part, we have cross products of a Y component with a Z component. And that's just going to give us an X component. But we had a minus sign as coefficient. So minus square root of three divided by two unit factor in the X direction. So that should be the numerator. For the denominator, let's write down our A1. So A1 is going to be half square root of three divided by two. Let's not write down the Z component here. And then for the second factor, we just copy the numerator back. So doing the correct ordering here for X, it's minus square root of three divided by two. And then we have minus one half. Okay, uh, cleaning this up, two pi divided by A. Let's also write the numerator in this particular form here. Okay, and then for the denominator, let's evaluate the inner product. So we have minus square root of three divided by four, and then the same thing once more. Now, all of the minus signs we, uh, we can get rid of. So finally, we have two pi over a, and then square root of three divided by two, one half, and then two divided by square root of three. Now, depending on your aesthetic preference, you can write this in many other forms. So this seems pretty clean. Okay. So that's one way of writing B1. Uh, but of course, you could also fully expand that. And then we have two pi over A. Uh, two pi over A squared root of three divided by three. Or again, you can factor out the two pi over a again. And then we have one square root of three divided by three. So all of these are the same. Just pick whatever one uh, you find most aesthetically pleasing. Good, so that's B1. Now for B2, B2 is very similar. So this is going to be the cross uh, product of a three with a one and then dividing by the same denominator, a one, a two, a three. So the denominator is going to be the same as for the case of B1. So the only thing we need to worry about for the time being is the numerator. So let's, let's look at the numerator here. So we have a three uh, with a one. So if we go back a little bit here, so a three is, uh, is going to be just along the z-axis. So let's then calculate the, inner, the, the vector product of z with x is going to give us y. So this is going to give us one half unit factor in the y direction. And then finally for z inner product with y, that's going to give us minus in the x direction. So minus square root of three divided by two in the x um, direction. So let's now just compare what we have here and what we had up there. And you see it's basically the same thing. The only thing which is different is now that the coefficient in front of the unit factor in the y direction just flips sign. So the entire calculation stays the same. The only thing that happens is that the y component flips sign. So finally, we can write that this is equal to two pi over a one and then minus square root of three divided by three. We don't care about B3 because that was an artificial direction uh, anyhow. But the good news is that we found the primitive reciprocal lattice factors, B1 and B2. So the question is, 
what type of lattice do these vectors form? If you take all of their linear combinations, what is the result? Now, in order to answer that question, a very useful auxiliary question would be if you draw, for example, the vector B1, what angle does B1 make with, with the horizontal? So just uh, make a quick sketch and try and figure out what that angle is, and then also taking all of the linear combinations of the different reciprocal primitive lattice factors. Good, so we have our vector B1, which makes a certain angle with the horizontal here, theta. However, we do know what the components are here. So we can, uh, just from the coordinate representation here, we know that the x-coordinate has length one, and the y-coordinate is square root of three divided by three. So it's very trivial to write down that the tangent of that angle is square root of three divided by three, or that the, the angle is just uh, 30 degrees. So let's try and make a nice drawing here. We have our origin, and then we have B1, which makes an angle of 30 degrees. So this is B1, and then we have B2, which makes an angle of minus 30 degrees. So this is B2. Constructing all of the linear combinations, easy ones to try are just minus B1 and minus B2. So this is going to give us these points. So we already have all of those points. And then we can, for example, calculate B1 minus B2. And then we draw a parallel parallelogram. So just pretend that this is a well-defined parallelogram. And then we do the same thing over here, taking the sum of these two points. And there you indeed already see that we do have another hexagon appearing. So the reciprocal lattice will be another hexagonal lattice. So this is what's happening in K-space. Let's just remember what we started out from in real space. So in real space, we had another hexagon. Uh, but let's look at the orientation of the hexagon. So let's move back to what we started out from. So if we have our hexagon here, if I draw in all the remainder, remaining lines, here you can see that we have a hexagon, uh, which is basically flat on top and at the bottom. Now, in our reciprocal lattice, we have another hexagon, but there the hexagon is, so to speak, flat on the left and the right hand side. So if you compare these two hexagons, you see that they are rotated with respect to 90 degrees uh, with, with, with one another. So we already made quite some significant progress. We know now that the reciprocal lattice is a, another hexagonal lattice rotated 90 degrees. But now the next step is trying to figure out the Brillouin zone. So for that, you need to do that uh, construction. So just pause the video and uh, try to make that construction. So obviously the success of this construction will depend on how accurate you write out, you, you can draw your lattice. So let's assume that this is more or less okay here. We have our, uh, our lattice vectors and let's try and build the, the construction. So what we need to do is we need to look at two adjacent vectors and then draw the perpendicular uh, bisector here, like so. And then we need to repeat that for all of the other lattice vectors. Now, because of symmetry, we also have this guy over here. And then let's now take a look at those guys. So again, this is going to go through these lattice vectors. And then look at this thing over here at the middle, perpendicular, going to give us this thing. The middle, perpendicular. In the middle and perpendicular. So there we have all of these bands of K-space. 
And what we basically need to do is we need to make the intersection between all of these bands. So the intersection between this band and that band and that band. So if you do that, if you make that intersection, then basically you end up with another hexagon. So the Brillouin zone is yet another hexagon in K-space. Let's take a look at the orientation here. This is a hexagon with a flat top and bottom. Whereas if you go back to our uh, K-space here, so it's again rotated uh, 90 degrees. So it has the same orientation, flat top and flat, flat bottom, like the hexagon that you see in, in real space. But don't confuse these two, uh, these two concepts, of course. Okay. So finally, once we have the Brillouin zone, the next step is trying to figure out what the irreducible Brillouin zone is. So for the irreducible Brillouin zone, we need to apply all sorts of symmetries that we can find in our lattice. So if we go back to our real uh, lattice, the types of symmetries that you find here are, for example, mirror symmetries. If you have a mirror, you have a mirror symmetry here over uh, the horizontal. So if you flip this thing over, you get exactly the same thing back. You can also easily see that if you do uh, that same flipping over a line which has an angle of 30 degrees, that again, you get exactly the same thing back. My drawing, of course, is horrible, so it's not that immediately obvious, but with a nice drawing, indeed, you can easily see that if you flip over a line with an angle of 30 degrees, then also the structure stays invariant. So what we need to do is do all of these flips over lines which are 30 degrees apart. And then it basically becomes obvious that the only part which is relevant here is this particular triangle over here. So once you have this triangle, if you keep on flipping it over these lines, which are 30 degrees apart, then you basically can cover this entire Brillouin zone. So this is our irreducible Brillouin zone. And as usual, the edges of the irreducible Brillouin zone get some names. So this is the gamma point, the origin, this is the K point, and then finally here we have the M point. Okay. So now we basically know everything there is to know about the hexagonal lattice.